So good to see all of you. I want to give a special shout out to everyone who's watching through church online and everybody who's here for the first time. Let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> and of course, those of you who are here every week, you know, we should we should put our hands together for you as well because that's the right choice being in God's house every week. Let's put our hands together for you as well. <laughs> I'm excited about today. Um, uh, just to be honest with you, this morning I uh, I, I went to bed at four o'clock. And it wasn't because there was some kind of wild party or something like it. Some of you are, are still, you know, maybe you're here and you went to a wild party. I didn't. We were waiting for our plane to leave uh, Tel Aviv Airport. And, um, and there was some kind of problem with the engine. I'm glad they checked it uh, because I may not have made it at all. Um, but they did check it. And uh, so we could leave only two hours later than, um, than the, the appointed time. So we... I. I Thankfully, I slept in, on the plane a couple of hours, and then I had a few hours that I could sleep uh, in my bed, and I'm here. <laughs> we had a, my wife and I, we had a phenomenal time in Israel. Um, I spoke for Israel Portar in Ashdod. On, uh, on, on Friday for the Shabbat services, and then, um, then also um, the week before I was in Paris, and um, and uh, was a revival a concert basically there. And, and what I'm noticing uh, in Europe, but also in Israel, is that God is up to something new. He's doing something amazing. Uh, you know, people are being reached with the gospel. Um, and so many things are happening now that, that wouldn't have happened a couple of decades ago. And, and God is really lining things up um, in Europe and um, in, Israel, in Israel as well for revival. And I'm, I'm so glad that we could get to be a part of that as well in our own area, in our own region. And I noticed that more and more people are open to the gospel, to the message of Jesus in our, you know, in Hilversum and Huizen, wherever we, wherever we are. So, so I'm so thankful that, that we get to see this with our own eyes and get to be a part of this uh, with, our, with, our, with our own lives. And today I want to I wanna wrap up our series that we've been working on uh, called The Lost Ascension. And now, uh, basically, what we did in the past couple of weeks is kind of lay a foundation of, um, you know, of some of the basics of the Christian faith, which uh, don't always seem as basic as we as we might think. But only if we we make sure that there's a there's a solid foundation for our faith, can we grow further in our relationship with God. And, and that's the whole purpose of this series. So today, I'm going to wrap that up. And um, in the past couple of weeks, we spoke about the past and the present of our faith. And today, I want to talk about the future of our faith. And before I get into uh, the word, you know, let's pray. Let's ask God to, uh, to reveal his word to us. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're here in our midst, God, that you love us, that you want to help us grow, um, encounter you in a real way and a very new way as well. And Father, speak to our hearts today. Open your word to us, not just by opening the Bible physically, but by really speaking to our hearts in a, in a, in a real way. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody say, amen. All right, so let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. And... Um, and look at what it says there. Uh, therefore, having, leaving the discussion of uh, the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, to spiritual growth, basically. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrines of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So today I'm going to talk about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this is, this is something you could talk about for hours and even weeks. We're not going to do that. Don't worry, you're, you're gonna get out of here pretty, pretty soon. But I wanna highlight a few things that are so important, so crucial for our Christian faith. And because it deals with the future, it deals with uh, some of the events in world history that are going to come and that we need to be ready for. So I wanna talk to you about that today. And uh, before uh, continuing with, you know, kind of, um, digging into that, I want to I go with you to Isaiah chapter 61, uh, because this is a 
prophetic word from, uh, that God gave to the prophet Isaiah. And Jesus actually quoted that same uh, passage when he started his ministry. So I want to read that as well. It's in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the, of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and a day of vengeance of our God. Here's an interesting thing that, um, that is here in the prophecy that God gave to Isaiah. Um, and especially the way how it ends, because it focuses on, on two things. Uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. There's something really positive here and something that sounds pretty negative. And this is, basically this, this prophecy is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ as, as, as Jesus the Messiah. And, and Isaiah looked forward to a day when the Messiah would come and would actually do this. But what Isaiah didn't see was that there were actually... You know, two components, two, um, two, um, two eras in which the, the Messiah would come uh, to, to this world. And, 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 and so these two aspects of his ministry need to be separated from each other uh, because he first came to fulfill the first part and then later came to fulfill the second part. So when you read this, um, read what um, Isaiah, what, what Jesus quoted on his first sermon that he brought, you see that he leaves out the second part, the day of vengeance of our God, which points towards the, um, the, the day of judgment. So he, he, he talks about the, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, but leaves out the day of vengeance of our God. Interesting. When you look at that, why did he leave that part out? The day of vengeance of our God. Did he forget it? Did Jesus... Was he forgetful or something? I, I don't think so. I mean, he was a son of God. And he was, you know, well-versed in the scripture. Did, did he maybe not want to offend his hearers by, by speaking about the day of vengeance of our God? I mean, that's what happens many times today in, in, in churches all over our country and all over the Western world is we, we are afraid to talk about the day of judgment. We're afraid to talk about hell because, we, you know, who we might offend some people in the congregation. And I'm hoping to not offend you today with speaking about this, but this is the truth. And we got to talk about the truth. And just to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of hope in this message, and especially towards the end. So don't, don't run out because I'm talking about hell or judgment or whatever uh, like that. You know, there's going to be a lot of hope for you in this message. But it starts out, you know, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't, doesn't refer to this. Didn't he believe it maybe? It's also possible. Didn't he believe that one day God would bring, you know, that the day of judgment to, to the world? Now, the first part of what is mentioned here, the, 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 the uh, acceptable year of the Lord, is fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. You know, when he walked around this earth, when he died on the cross, and when he rose again. And the second part of this prophecy, the day of vengeance of our God, is still to be fil fulfilled in the future. The question is, when will it happen? I want to talk to you about that today. And in fact, one other, one other um, biblical concept that, um, that God, God kind of impressed on my heart over the la these last couple of months um, that, that gives me a sense of urgency that, hey, this, this day of vengeance, the, the day of judgment might be coming sooner than we think. And that's based on the biblical feasts. You know, if you, if you know the Old Testament a little bit, you know that there's, you know, the Israelites were always in, encouraged to celebrate certain things. And um, a couple of those feasts are, take place in the, in the spring of the year. And a couple of other feasts take place in the fall of the year. And there's a, there's a great illustration of that here. So you see the spring holidays, the spring feasts, and you see the fall feasts right there. And, and when you look at this, you see that all the spring feasts already have been fulfilled in Jesus. 
in what he's, what he's done on the earth so far and what we can read in the Bible. Um, when, you know, Passover, which is not the same as Easter, is just, uh, like this past year, it kind of, this year it actually uh, coincided with uh, Good Friday and next year I heard it's the same thing as well. But the Pas- Passover is... Is, is basically the feast where the Israelites remembered that they um, that uh, that the angel of death would come um, and uh, and they and it would pass over their houses because of the blood of the lamb that was was on on their doorposts. So their their firstborn child wouldn't be wouldn't be killed by the angel of angel. Uh, of the Lord, but in the, Isra- in the Egyptian households, he would be killed. But that Passover feast is fulfilled in Jesus' death on the cross. And then there's the, the feast of unleavened bread, which is uh, fulfilled in Jesus' burial. And then there's the feast of the first fruits. And Jesus is, is uh, you know, when the Bible speaks about Jesus, Jesus actually is the first fruit of those who rise from the dead, because there is a resurrection of the dead in the future. Jesus was the first one. So the first fruits festival has been fulfilled uh, three days later in Jesus' resurrection. And then there's a period of 50 days. So this is all in one weekend. Then there's 50 days of waiting. And then, then there's the Feast of Pentecost. And it's also called the Feast of Weeks. And that is the feast where, as Christians, we celebrate the fact that uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out on, on the believers. And that there, um, there was, um, the, the church was birthed out of that as well. In, in a blaze of Pentecost fire. So those are the spring holidays. And all these feasts have been fulfilled uh, in, uh, in Jesus' first coming. But the fall feasts, those on that side of the slide, they have not yet been fulfilled. At least the bit, for the big part, they have not been fulfilled. And let me explain to you uh, that, that in a couple of moments. So my first take home is this. I got six for you today, so write them down. The first one is this. Jesus' return and the day of judgment are certain. Jesus' return and the day of judgment are certain. And to me, this, you know, just li- li- looking at that prophecy in Isaiah 61 and, and seeing how these uh, feasts are all constructed, to me, was a big confirmation that, hey, if God fulfilled the first feast, the, the spring feast in the person of Jesus, he's going to fulfill the fall feast in the person of Jesus as well. To me, it was a big confirmation. Hey, this is going to happen. We don't know exactly when. We'll talk about that later. So Jesus' return in the day of judgment are certain. So I want to talk to you about those, those fall feasts. So maybe we could put it back up. I want to talk to you about the Feast of Trumpets. And, and the Feast of Trumpets in, in Hebrew is called the Rosh Hashanah. And that's the Jewish New Year. And it, so it's otherwise referred to as the Feast of Trumpets. And a trumpet is actually not a, um, like a metal type of musical Instrument. It's. It looks like something else. It's like a ram's horn. Maybe. Uh, maybe uh, Leo can come up with his uh, shofar because that's the Hebrew word that's actually being used. Why don't you show us what a shofar, true shofar, looks like? See, that's a shofar. And um, so, so what would happen um, when they would celebrate Rosh Hashanah is that um, that this ram's horn, this, this shofar, would be blown. To basically, in the, uh, to basically indicate that the king was coming. The king was coming. And, and um, Fina actually spoke about that during, you know, during worship. That our king is coming back. And, and so, so, so show us how that sounds. <laughs> you make it hard for me. <laughs> Why? Okay, because when Jesus comes and the shofar will be blown. Right. Well... That will be incredible. Right. So I will try to blow it. Right. I, this is not my usual practice, but I'll try right. to blow it. <laughs> awesome. I'm sure you do well. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. So that is the sun. That is the sound that you will hear when, when Jesus will return. When uh, Rosh Hashanah spiritually will be happening in the future. And in fact, there's in 1 Thessalonians, it says this, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet, with the shofar of God. 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amazing. Promise. Amazing scripture, you know. Uh, so we're, we'll be caught up in the air. When Jesus comes back the first time, he will not actually tread on the earth. He will just stay like, you know, uh, basically on a cloud. And he will rapture everyone up who is a believer in Jesus. And we shall be with him for forever from that moment onwards. And, and the sound of the shofar is actually the sound that will indicate this, this thing from happening. And every year in Israel, they will celebrate, they celebrate Rosh Hashanah and you'll hear this trumpet. And they're looking forward basically to the coming of, of Messiah. The second feast, fall feast, is the Day of Atonement. And in, um, in Hebrew, it's called Yom Kippur. And, you know, a big part of that feast was like, um, there were there were two goats that um, that, that had to be taken uh, to the temple by the by the high priest, and on one of them the, the high priest would lay his hands on the head of the of the of the of the animal, who basically symbolically transfer the sins of the people on the head of that animal, and then they would drive that animal into the desert, and he would carry the sins from the Israelites to the desert, basically walking them away from from the people of God. And and Jesus fulfilled that. Jesus fulfilled when, when he when Jesus died on the cross, when he died on the cross outside of the camp, outside of the, the city of Jerusalem, on the on that hill called Golgotha, he, he took that, that 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 burden of sin with him and took it away from from the people. Gone. That happened when Jesus died on the cross. But there's a second aspect to this to this feast, and that's the, um, that's the, that's the judgment part. It's like uh, the other goat was supposed to be sacrificed for the sins of the people. So it was taken in the Holy of Holies, the, holy of, the most holy place of the temple, where that um, goat would be, uh, would be sacrificed, and for the sins of the, of the people as well. And, and that goat symbolizes the day of judgment that is, that is coming. Now it says this in John 5, 28, and these are Jesus' words. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all, all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There are two resurrections that the Bible speaks about, that Jesus speaks about. And, and, and the, these two groups who will be resurrected will all face some kind of judgment, but the judgment looks very different between those two uh, parties. The believers will be resurrected to life, and the unbelievers will be resurrected to, to judgment. Let me explain it a little bit more, because, you know, in, in the book of Revelation, you actually see in Revelation chapter 20 that uh, there's, a, there's a judgment called, like, the great white throne judgment, and says this in, in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, that's God, who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which are written in the books. I'll tell you a little more about that book of life, but here, here's my second take home for you to write down, and that's this. Believers escape the day of judgment because their names are written in the book of life. That's why it's so important to, in your lifetime to make a decision to follow Jesus because that, spiritually speaking, will make sure your, your name is written in the book of life and you escape this great right throne judgment. That's what, when you, when you continue reading Revelation 20, verse 13, it says this, the dead gave up the dead, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the, death, the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So on the negative side, if our names are not written in the book of life, where our, our future is the lake of fire, but hey, we have an opportunity today. We have a chance today. And I believe that every person in this world has this chance to, to say, hey, God, I want to I wanna serve you. I want to make you number one in my life so that your name will be found in the book of life as well. 
And then there's a different type of judgment that happens for, the, for those who actually believe in Jesus. That's the judgment seat of Christ. And you can find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Therefore, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him, to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So these are believers that are being judged for their works uh, and their names have already been found in the book of life. So, so they're certain that they, will be, that they are saved. They're certain that their future with God is, is safe. But God looks at the things that we've done in this life and, and, and there's actually rewards that we can, that we can receive in, in heaven for the, the things that we've done, you know, how, to, uh, how we basically helped other people find Jesus, how we've served the poor and those type of things. The works of those who are in the book of life will be judged to determine their rewards, but the believer himself will be saved. We can be sure of that. This is important to realize that we make a decision to, to follow Jesus and make sure our names are in the book of life. And then the last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. It just happened a, probably about two, three weeks ago in, in Israel that they celebrated this feast. And in Hebrew, it's called Sukkoth. And in uh, Leviticus 23, verse 41, it basically explains how this feast kind of runs. And it says this, You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So you gotta, you gotta picture this. So going back to all these feasts, maybe we can put it back up. So trumpets and the day of atonement. Those two are very grave, very, very heavy feasts almost because it's like a lot of introspection going on. Is there anything by which I've offended God? Is there anything that kind of keeps me away from God and you're kind of searching your soul? Are there things that hold me back from following him completely? But then after those two feasts are done, there's the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a feast that's full of joy. It's like, it's a happy time. Everybody's involved in this. Kids love it. Everybody loves it because they get to live in tents. I don't know about you, but I have kids that are eight years old. The, the one thing that they love doing most is living, being in the garden and having a tent there. So imagine doing that again as an adult. That's what happened in, uh, in Israel. It still happens today. And so, this, so, so Sukkoth is a celebration of a new, renewed relationship with God. It is a joyful celebration because our sins have been atoned for and we now have open access to God our Father. And when the new heavens and new earth will come, all nations will celebrate this, this feast. This is something not just for the Jews, it's for, for all of us. So this booth, this Sukkoth, Sukkah, was a tw- temporary dwelling place. It was a hut. It was supposed to be built in either in the backyard or maybe on a balcony or something like that. And the Israelites had to live in it for, for a week. And, and as they did that, they were reminded of their exodus out of Egypt, out of their slavery to the Egyptians. And now they had freedom again. They, they were living in the desert. They're still there for, you know, as, as uh, temporarily in the desert. But they knew they had now, they had open access to God the Father. There was like an open heaven over them. Because they were walking in, in the plan of God. They were, and this is pointing forward to a, the messianic age where they would dwell face to face with God forever. And that's why this sukkah is supposed to be built like under an open heaven in the backyard. There's a spiritual significance there. But how does this relate to our faith today? How does this relate to uh, how, we, um, how we basically see the... The, the, the next things that are supposed to happen in world history, how, do, how does this tie together? On well, the New Testament, it says this, in, again in Revelation chapter 21. John says this, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God will tabernacle. He will dwell. He will live in a booth with us, among us. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said to me, Write, write for these words are true and faithful. I don't know about you, but that's the world I'm longing for. With no more tears, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. And I just, you know, heard, you know, on the way back from the airport last night, like in the middle of the night, my wife pulls up this article on New Pentanel. And, um, and, and, and it says something about the nuclear, you know, you know, uh, the Americans and, and, the, and the, the, um, how the Russians haven't basically kept the agreements and started building up like nuclear weapons again. And um, um, then Trump wanting to pull out of that. It's like, man, the peace that we have right now in our world is a, is a armed peace. It's not a real peace. It's like if there's an inequality in the, in the, in the power structure uh, in the world, war can happen from one moment to the next. But the peace that God speaks about here is something different. This is something uh, perfect, something amazing. Uh, real shalom is co- going to come to this world and, because God will live among us. Jesus will, lo- will live among us. And that's take home number three. When Jesus returns, he will live among us. You may wonder, when is this all going to happen? Well, Jesus says, you don't know the day nor the hour, but we can know the times and the seasons when Jesus is going to return. I mean, don't try to pinpoint a certain time, a certain year, a certain day, which some so-called prophets have done uh, recently, and and all of them were wrong. So I'm I'm not going to give an attempt for that either, because I don't want to be wrong. (laughs) And it also says that the day of judgment will come as a thief in the night. Jesus, you know, says it himself as well. And Paul says it. But, but let me tell you this. So the fall feasts still need to happen. But what is going to happen before those fall feasts are, are fulfilled? It's actually, Jesus speaks about it in Matthew chapter 24. And he says that false Christ will come who will deceive many people. He says that wars and famines will come. He says that persecution and tribulation will come. He says that false prophets will come and that love will grow cold. It says that there will be a falling away from the faith. It kind of sounds like our, our day today, right? That's what he speaks about. But then in verse 14, he says this, and this gospel, the good news of the kingdom, will be preached in all the world, world, world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So here's an important key here. So, so Jesus will not come back before the good news is heard in every tribe and tongue and every nation. But you know what? There's this organization called, called Wycliffe. They're Bible translators. How many of you heard of, of Wycliffe, right? So they translate the Bible to, to every language that they can find. And there's many languages in this world. And, and their, their prediction is that by the year 20, 2024... There will be a Bible translation, either a full Bible translation or a part of the scripture that is translated to every language in the world. So that means that every person should be able to hear by 2024. Now, I'm not going to say to you that Jesus is going to return in 2024. You will not hear me say that. I'm just trying to say to you that this can be quicker than we think. And you and I were all commissioned to, to bring that message of hope, that message of, of Jesus Christ, that message of good news to, to every person that we encounter, to our colleagues, our friends, our neighbors, our family members who don't know Jesus yet. We're all called to do this. We're commissioned to, to, to reach the people on our doorstep because the nations are on our doorstep. I mean, they're represented here in this church. They're represented in, you know, in, in, in the city that you live in, the areas you live in. And it takes me to take home number four, and it's this. Jesus' return and the day of judgment will arrive sooner than you think. So there is a sense of urgency. There, we got to live in anticipation for the return of Jesus. we got to be ready. we got to get other people ready because the day is coming soon. we got to wake up as a church and reach the people that are lost. But how do we respond to that as Christians? First John chapter 3, verse 2. 
It says this, dear friends, we are already God's children. That's what a great confirmation is that. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. Now, this is a hard message for, for us living in a world with so many temptations, so many things coming against us. But when we have heaven on our minds, when we have Jesus on our minds, this is the thing we'll want to do. Live pure lives. Live lives that are focused on Jesus and nothing more than Jesus. You know, when we have heaven on our minds, when we have the future on our minds of how Jesus is going to return, we will we'll want to live pure lives. And we want to get rid of sin and other stuff that kind of holds us back from following Jesus completely. So that's an encouragement for, for you and I. When we have Jesus in heaven on our minds, we will want to live pure lives. That's take home number five. But maybe you're here today. You're thinking, man, I'm not, not there yet. I have questions about this, this Jesus. I have questions about the faith. And you're not following him yet. Back to Isaiah chapter 61. Remember that Jesus didn't quote that part of the day of vengeance of our God, but he did quote the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of God's favor. We're still today, we're still living in a year of God's favor. We're still living in a, in a, in a time where we can actually respond to God. We can actually say, Lord, here I am. Forgive me for the sins that I've, I've committed in my life. Forgive me for not turning my life to, over to you. We still have that opportunity to turn to him. And that's why this message today is not a message of judgment, but a message of hope. God is still patient with you and I. He's still patient with humanity, even those who are far from God at this moment, giving opportunities to all who are alive today to come to repentance and to turn to him. If you wonder why Jesus hasn't, hasn't come back yet, here's the answer. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's God's heart, that we all have that opportunity to turn to him. He wants all of us to come to repentance and to turn our faith towards God. And he wants us who are saved already to help other people be saved for eternity. What an opportunity we have today. And that takes me to take on number six, last one. Because of God's favor, Jesus' return is delayed. That's why he's still waiting for us to get involved with this great commission, reach as many people as we can with that beautiful message of Jesus. You know what, if, if you're doubting, you know, this is a step that I should take to turn my life to Jesus and make him number one in my life. Second Corinthians 6, 2 says this, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait any longer. Don't, don't push this off. I will do it when I turn 80 years old. Don't, don't, don't push it off. I'll, I'll do it when, when I'm sick with cancer or, or something else. No, do it today. Because you don't know what's going to come to your life. You don't know when Jesus is going to return either. So today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of God's favor to enter into your life. We still live in a time of favor. There's still time for you to make a decision. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And it's God's kindness that leads you to repentance. God is standing. Picture him. Maybe we could just close our eyes and bow our heads at this moment. But picture him standing with his arms wide open, ready to receive you ready to receive you into his arms. I want to extend favor to you, he says. I want to show you my love. I want to show you the amazing life you could have with me. And I believe there's some people in this room today with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I believe there are some people in this room who God has spoken to you today. You realize that this, is, this truly is a day of God's favor and this truly is a moment where God is asking you to turn your ways to him. 
This truly is a moment where God wants you to give you that certainty that you're saved for eternity, that your name truly is in the book of life. You can receive that certainty today. You can be fully assured that God is going to take you with him, that Jesus is going to take you with him when he, you know, raptures the church and everyone who follows him. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if that's you, if you want to say to God, God, I want to turn my life to you. I want to, want to make you number one. I want, to, I want my name to be in the book of life. And you're not sh- sure about that at this moment. I want, to, I want to ask you just to take a bold step in just a moment. Everybody's head, heads bowed and eyes closed to give you a little bit of privacy. I don't want to single you out or in any way, but I just want to know who I can pray for. If that's you, just raise your hand right now. If that's you. I know there's people here that need to raise their hands. I see one hand right there. Thank you so much. I know there's more people that need to respond. That's you, just raise your hand. I'll give you a brief moment to think about this decision. Because it's the most important decision you could ever make. That's you, just raise your hand. And let's pray. Maybe we could pray this prayer out loud together. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus. That you died on the cross for my sin that you rose from the dead on the third day so that I may have abundant life and eternal life. Today, I want to turn my life over to you. I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. I want my name to be in the book of life. Thank you, God, for everything that you've done for me. Thank you, God, for making a way where there didn't seem to be a way. And I turn to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give a applause for those who made a decision.